1962, the Cold War was at its height. The Red Army threatened Western Europe with mass invasion. And an attempt by the Soviet Union to sneak missiles into Castro's Cuba brought this response from President Kennedy. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace. Marilyn Monroe made her last public appearances before dying of a drugs overdose. Mass murderer Adolf Eichmann was hanged after being found guilty in a Jewish court of crimes against humanity. And more controversially, in Britain, crowds gathered to protest about the hanging of James Hanratty for the A6 murder. On the 26th of April, a funeral was held at Golders Green Crematorium in North London. Mrs. Molly Young had died suddenly, apparently from the after effects of a recent accident. She had been found five days earlier, writhing in agony in the garden of their home on the North Circular Road by her husband Fred when he returned for lunch. Fred Young had also found his 14 year old son Graham watching his stepmother through the kitchen window, apparently too stunned with shock to raise the alarm. Molly Young was rushed to hospital, but doctors could not save her, and she died that afternoon. Graham was very insistent that his stepmother should be cremated quickly, and his distraught family agreed to this in the hope of sparing Fred Young any further misery. At the reception afterwards, one of Graham's uncles began vomiting after adding some pickle to a sandwich. These were not the first illnesses to plague the Young's household. Molly Young's stomach pains had begun several months before. And when Fred Young also suffered severe cramps, he had wondered whether chemicals from Young Graham's chemistry experiments were contaminating their cooking utensils. Unknown to the Youngs, one of Graham's school friends, Chris Williams, had also suffered cramp in his legs and chest and severe headaches. Chris's pains had become so severe that he had also been taken to the Wilsdon General Hospital, where doctors diagnosed a severe migraine. One morning in November 1961, Graham's sister Winifred had set off for work. She had found her breakfast tea tasted bitter and only drank a mouthful. During the journey, she collapsed and was taken to the Middlesex Hospital. After making tests, doctors decided that Winifred had taken belladonna, a poison extracted from the deadly nightshade plant. When she was released from the hospital, Winifred accused her brother of being careless with his chemical experiments. He vehemently denied this. Both children had had a somewhat disturbed childhood when their mother died of pleurisy shortly after Graham's birth. Winifred was sent to her grandmother, while Graham was looked after by Fred's sister. The family was reunited when Fred Young remarried in 1950, but he never became close to his son, as Graham's uncle Frank Walker recalls. His father, as far as I knew, had no time for him whatsoever. He, he never, well, what can I say, he never cherished, cherished him as he should do or anything like that. Graham grew up an awkward, solitary child. But he was bright enough to pass the 11-plus exam and get a place at the John Kelly High School. There he appeared bored by any subject other than his obsession, chemistry, and in particular the study of poisons. Graham started borrowing books on medicine and poisons, and his family caught him with bottles which he admitted to having stolen from the dustbins of local chemists. By the time he was 13, Graham was an expert on poisons and their effects. He was also showing some other rather disturbing obsessions. I've been round to uh, the house and his wife, who is uh, his stepmother, his late stepmother, she showed me photos of what he'd drawn of coffins with RIP and death and all that kind of thing. 
she used to show and she said, what do you think of these kind of things? So I said, well, you're boy, isn't he? Graham was open in his admiration for William Palmer, the Victorian poisoner who killed some 13 people, and for Dr. Crippen, who had murdered his wife with hyacinth in 1910. Shortly after his wife's death, Fred Young fell ill again with stomach pains and headaches. His doctors were unable to find anything wrong at first. Then the laboratory came up with an extraordinary diagnosis. Fred Young had been poisoned with antimony, a rare metallic substance. One more dose would have been fatal. Graham hotly denied any involvement with what had happened. Nothing suspicious could be found, and his family was reluctant to believe any ill of him. But one of Graham Young's science masters at school had long been troubled by the boy's obsession with poison. He arranged for Graham to be interviewed by a psychiatrist, posing as a career's guidance advisor. The interview took place at the school on the 20th of May, a month after Graham's stepmother had died. Graham quickly began to talk about his favorite subject of poisons. He seemed delighted and flattered to be able to show off his remarkable knowledge of toxicology. As soon as the interview finished and Graham had left the room, the psychiatrist rang the police. And the next day, while Graham was at school, his room was searched by a detective inspector. Enough poison was found to kill 300 people. When Graham got home that evening, he was found to be carrying a file of antimony and two bottles, one of which proved to contain thallium. After trying to deny that he had had anything to do with the poisoning of his family, Graham finally broke down and admitted that he reveled in the power that carrying and using poison gave him. Some years later, a school friend, Chris Krieger, recalled his bizarre behavior. He always had, uh, or usually had, poison with him. He particularly carried a file of either answering potassium tartrate or, or some other drug in his top left-hand pocket small file about so big and um, he'd often take it out and look at it and refer to it as his little friend. Gradually as he realized I could appreciate what he was doing he began to tell me and to hint to me that he, he was poisoning people, you know, his mother was sick and was that and the other and um, over the period of time it became you know, I knew that he was doing it, he knew that I did, and he didn't even try and hide it. He often used to discuss it and come in and tell me how ill his mother was or what he was doing or what poisons he was using. And uh, towards the latter part, I remember he showed me a graph, and one axis of the graph was what he said was a state of her illness, and the other axis was um, when he was giving her doses of poison. At the Old Bailey on the 6th of July, 1962, Graham Young pleaded guilty to poisoning his sister, father, and school friend, Chris Williams. Among the doctors who examined him while he was on remand was Donald Blair, a consulting psychiatrist who reported... There is no doubt in my mind that this youth is at present a very dangerous, a very serious danger to other people. His intense obsession and almost exclusive interest in drugs and their poisoning effects is not likely to change, and he could well repeat his cool, calm, calculating administration of these poisons at any time. Mr. Justice Melford Stevenson had no hesitation in ordering that Young should be detained in Broadmoor, the psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane. He should not be released for at least 15 years, and then only with the approval of the Home Secretary of the day. At 14 and a half, Graham Young was one of only three males under 16 sent to Broadmoor this century. He was given his own cell in the reception block, away from the crowded main prison. His family tried to show that he had not been abandoned and made regular visits, but it seemed that Young's obsession had not been curtailed by his imprisonment. The only thing he used to say to me that he, he wanted matches, which at that time didn't ring a bell to me. But I presume that you can make poison out of matches, can't you? Frank Walker's suspicions were correct, and Young soon began to acquire a fairly sinister reputation with the other inmates and staff at Broadmoor, as one of his fellow prisoners later remembered. 
He had obsessions, uh, obsession with toxicology, which he wanted to pursue. Uh, Nazism, um, Hitler, Mein Kampf, the rise and fall of the Third Reich, uh, witchcraft and demonology. Uh, he had a, a satanic obsession, which he wanted to take to a satanic conclusion. Well, quite frankly, I mean, he wanted to uh, go down in history as the poisoner of all time. Much of Young's treatment was in the hands of Dr. Edgar Udwin, a senior resident psychiatrist who worked hard to try to rehabilitate the boy. He was given a responsible job in the kitchens, but this was stopped when the nurse's coffee was found to contain lavatory cleaner. Over the next few years, Young seemed to grow calmer and less obsessed, until by mid-1970, the authorities considered that he might soon be eligible for release. Finally, at the beginning of 1971, the Home Office agreed to release Young early, provided he undertook further treatment. Unfortunately, no one had mentioned to the Home Office a remark that Young was said to have made a short while previously. When I get out, I'm going to kill one person for every year I've spent in this place. On the 4th of February, 1971, Young walked free from Broadmoor and was sent to a government training center at Slough. Here, he undertook a course in store management and received a glowing report. But what the report did not mention was that throughout the course, its participants had been plagued by a mysterious stomach bug. One of the most seriously affected was Trevor Sparks, who had severe abdominal pains. Doctors could find nothing wrong with him, despite the fact that his symptoms continued for more than two months. As the course neared its end, Young applied for a job as a storekeeper at John Hadland Limited in Bovingdon in Hertfordshire. The company specialized in high-speed photographic and optical equipment. The training center's report on Graham Young was read with interest by Hadland's managing director, Godfrey Foster. This man has an above average intelligence. He is very conscientious in his work, able to work to instructions given to him, as well as on his own initiative. Mr. Foster did notice one slightly disquieting reference to psychiatric help that Young had needed in the past and contacted the centre. They said that um, they would send me further information on Graham Young. And um, three days later, um, I received this letter. Dear sir, in response to your request, I am forwarding a copy of Dr. Unwin's report on Mr. Young. I am sure you will find this satisfactory. The document attached to that letter was a medical certificate on Graham Frederick Young, which I'll read out for me. This man has suffered a deep going personality disorder, which necessitated his hospitalization throughout the whole of his adolescence. He has, however, made an extremely full recovery and is now entirely fit for discharge, his sole disability now being the need to catch up on his lost time. Young was offered the job and started work on Monday the 10th of May. He was smartly dressed in a suit and tie. The other staff found their newest colleague something of a loner, as Storman Jethro Batt described. Well, he, he was an unpopular, put it that way, you know, he never, he never kind of uh, upset too many people, to my knowledge, he just kept to himself and that was it, you know, he was just a banana and unto himself type thing. But they did remark on his somewhat unusual interests. His general conversation was about uh, macabre things, you know, war, poisoners and uh, that kind of thing, you know, you know, it's pretty limited. Quite often he, he, he's good at taking off Hitler speeches, actually. I don't know whether they're genuine Hitler speeches, but they're in English, obviously, you know, and he did all the, the Hitler thing, you know, the... All the, you know, the way that the Hitler is supposed to have done all this. At times, the young man seemed quite absent-minded, and the storeroom staff soon became quite protective towards him. He was particularly befriended by two of the older men, Bob Eagle, the 59-year-old storeroom manager, and Fred Biggs, 
the 60-year-old work-in-progress manager. Young seemed to appreciate their kindness and took to fetching them tea from the trolley. This was brought round morning and afternoon, but often left unattended so that people could go back and help themselves as they wanted. Having stayed for his first few days at work with his now married sister Winifred in Hemel Hempstead, Young moved into a bedsitter in nearby Maynard's Road. On the 3rd of June, Bob Eagle became ill with stomach pains and took a few days off work. He briefly seemed to recover, but then became paralyzed and died suddenly on the 7th of July. A post-mortem recorded Eagle's death as being from bronchial pneumonia and polyneuritis. Although deeply saddened, his colleagues at Hadlands were unsuspicious. Then in early September 1971, Fred Biggs also began to suffer stomach cramps and vomiting. On the 20th of September, import-export manager Peter Buck suffered the same symptoms after having some tea with Young and a clerk, Dave Tilson. On the 8th of October, Tilson also fell ill after a tea break, and two days later, his legs began to go numb. Only a week later, Young's fellow storeman, 39-year-old Jethro Bat, began to suffer appalling pain, as he later described. At this time, I was getting... Uh, this this feeling that somebody had put on an old, you know, the old uh, dueling glove, the male glove, you know, the metal glove, and they'd uh, somehow got right inside my ribs, and they were grabbing hold of what was inside and just twist, squeezing and twisting like that. And, and that's no word of a lie. That's when you asked me for the gun, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that when was... When he got to the point of asking for a gun to shoot himself, you know, in that you did agony, that. yeah. Jethro Bat's pain grew steadily worse and his hair also began to fall out. When he was taken to hospital on the 5th of November, he was almost completely bald. Fred Biggs had returned to work on the 6th of November, feeling better, but he had to leave again almost immediately and was soon in hospital. By now, the management and staff of Hadlands were seriously alarmed by this mystery bug that had struck so severely. Some reckoned that it was a malevolent local virus or that the water supply might have become contaminated. Others, that it might be caused by radioactive experiments which had been carried out at a nearby disused airfield. A team of factory inspectors was called in, but nothing was found to substantiate any of the rumors. Meanwhile, Fred Biggs had been transferred to the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases in London. There, on Friday the 19th of November, he died. At Hadlands, a staff meeting was told by the company doctor that there was no evidence of radiation or other contamination. The doctor was surprised when Graham Young asked about heavy metal poisoning with thallium and showed unusual knowledge of the symptoms. The doctor told Hadlands management of this they decided to advise the police. Scotland Yard was asked to check whether any of Hadland's employees had criminal records. By chance, the head of Hertfordshire's CID, Detective Chief Superintendent Ronald Harvey, was going to a lunch for forensic scientists. When he described the symptoms of some of the victims, they were unanimous that it was thallium poisoning. Then came the news from Scotland Yard that Graham Young had only recently been released from Broadmoor, where he had spent nine years for poisoning his family. The police now raced to Young's bedsitter. He had gone away for the weekend, so they tried his sister's home. Finally, they tracked him down to his father and aunt's house in Sheerness, where he was arrested by the local police. On his way back to Hemel Hempstead, Young seemed arrogant and unconcerned. And once questioning started, he seemed ready to admit that he had been poisoning his workmates. But then he refused to sign a written statement. The police were able to track down the chemists at which Young had acquired the poisons which were found in his bedsitter. Young had forged letters of authorization 
pretending to be a medical researcher. The management at Hadlands was appalled at the way in which his true history had been concealed. Had I known of Graham Young's background and subsequently employed him, then as soon as anyone was ill, particularly anyone working closely with him, I could have taken the appropriate action to see that this was investigated. As it was, Robert Eagle was ill for four, five weeks before he was finally taken um, ill at the time which resulted in his death. Not only his life could have been saved, of course, but the second death would never have occurred and the other people associated with this business who experienced extreme suffering would have been protected from that. Meanwhile, the body of Fred Biggs and the exhumed ashes of Bob Eagle were sent to the forensic labs at Scotland Yard. After extensive tests, it was announced that both men had died of thallium poisoning. On the 3rd of December, 1971, Graham Young was charged with the two murders. It was the first time that thallium had ever been used as a poison in Britain, and the first time that evidence had ever been obtained from the examination of cremated ashes. Young's trial began at St Albans Crown Court on Monday the 19th of June, 1972, before Mr Justice Evely. Young was charged with the murders of Bob Eagle and Fred Biggs. The attempted murders of David Tilson and Jethro Batt. And the malicious poisoning of several of his other colleagues at Hadlands, among them Diana Smart, Ron Hewitt and Peter Buck. For the prosecution, John Leonard QC described the series of extraordinary illnesses at Hadlands and the poisons found at Young's bedsitter. The horrific suffering of the victims made a powerful impression on the court. The widows of Fred Biggs and Robert Eagle gave harrowing accounts of their husband's pain-racked last few days. The dispenser at one of the chemists which had supplied thallium identified Graham Young as the man who had obtained it. But all this evidence was circumstantial. There was no direct proof that it was Graham Young who had administered the poisons. Under the law protecting defendants, the jury could not be told about Young's former conviction for poisoning or his years in Broadmoor. So the trial came to hinge on a diary kept by Young, which had been found in his bedsitter. In this, he described the progress of his macabre experiments. Under cross-examination, he attempted to dismiss this damning evidence as the basis for a novel. And his defense counsel, Sir Arthur Irvine QC, argued that Young would hardly have been likely to parade his knowledge of poisons if he had been committing murder at the same time. But these explanations and Young's cool arrogance did not impress the jury. It took only one and a half hours to find him guilty of both the murders and the attempted murders. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. Once his previous conviction and release had become known, controversy erupted into how this could have happened. A public inquiry into the guidelines relied upon for the release of prisoners recommended significant changes to those rules. Young died of a heart attack in prison in August 1990. There can be little doubt that he had succeeded in his ambition of becoming one of the most sinister and deadly poisoners of all time. <laughs>